Hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we challenge you and equip you to dare to hear the voice of God. And today, I am excited to introduce to you my special guest, Bishop Bill Hammond. I cut my teeth on the prophetic, on many of his books and he has been a forerunner in the prophetic movement and actually in the body of Christ. He's been in ministry for 66 years. Uh, Bishop Bill Hammond is the founder of Christian International Ministry Network, a prophet for more than 60 years. He has prophesied to more than 50,000 people and provided training for more than 500,000 in prophetic ministry. He has authored several major books specializing in the restoration of the church and what to expect next on God's agenda. Well, Bishop Hammond, Hammond, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. It's a joy to be with you, Debbie, and it's exciting to talk about the great things that God's doing on the earth and in his church today. You know, most all of my books, a uh, whole stack of them here, uh, are written on the restoration of the church. But this new one on God's highest calling, it's probably my most important book for the individual. Because it, once you get the revelation that's in this book, knocks all the why out of every trauma, every, every strange experience you've had. For as a Christian, you learn why you go through things and why things happen. And you come to the confidence that Apostle Paul had that all things work together for your good to conform you to the likeness of Christ. Because for when, he, when he foreknew us, he predestined us to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ Jesus. So that's the reason I call it our highest calling. You know, even though I'm an apostle prophet, uh, over four or five hundred thousand churches around the world. I've done all the great ministries. Yet that's not my highest calling. My highest calling is to be conformed to Christ. And God's calling for that will supersede all the works and the great things that I myself would want to do and be and fulfill. And in my early days, back when I was about 22 years old, pastor in a little church in Topnos, Washington, the state of Washington. I understand that's where you're from. And uh, uh, I was fussing at the Lord. Lord, I need to be traveling. I need to be preaching, prophesying. The, uh, the world needs me, and I'm stuck here in this little old church, these few people. And uh, Lord, I know I've gotten married, and we're having children, and, but I, I'm not accomplishing anything. And he said to me, he said, Bill Hammond, I called you to be a co-laborer with me. I called you to be my son. I called you to be a part of my purpose. And it says, my main purpose and my call for you is to learn to think like I think, be like I be. I want to bring you to the place I can trust you as much as my heavenly father trusted me. He sent me to this earth to fulfill a purpose. Now I've got you here on earth to fulfill a purpose for me. And I want you to be able to be like me, think like me, to conform to my image. And he said, let me tell you something. If you never mount to a hill of beans, that's my Oki language, <laughs> and nobody ever knows you beyond your family, or you could never get beyond the state of Washington. He said, but if you learn to be conformed to my image, and that I can depend on you, trust you, and enable you to fulfill my will and purpose. As far as I'm concerned, you're the most successful person on planet Earth. So that's the plan of the seed. I didn't have the full revelation. That plan of the seed that's worked into the fruit of this tree today, um, your highest calling. And I tell you, when you realize your highest calling is to be like him and not to be the greatest minister in the world, doing the greatest works. It takes the pressure off of you and releases you to realize that God is at work. And like Philippians says, it's God who's at work within you, both to will and to do according to his own purpose. And his purpose is to make us like Christ Jesus himself. Absolutely. And and I'm sure, and I talk about all the experiences you've gone through has meaning and purpose when you understand God's process. Even though you're young and not as many years as mine, uh, near, near, near as much, but I'm sure you've had at least one trauma, heartbreaking, mind-blowing, world-shaking situation that you said, God, why me? I prayed, I believed, and still we went through it. Why? And I, every minister I've ever talked to, every successful minister, every Christian has gone through those, and they still have the why. But once you understand God's process, most people, most Christians, know that in the back of their mind that to be like Christ is God's greatest purpose and desire for them. What they don't know is the process. And that law of transformation and the process of conformity is what really brings a revelation. And you can be able to say with Paul, I know all things are working together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. And I tell people, can you believe it? Romans 8, 28, 29 is as true as John 3, 16. Mm, that's good. 
Because if John 3, 16 is, is for all this, and Apostle Paul is the one that wrote it. Now, when Paul says these in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he said, these light afflictions work for us. The Lord asked me one day, what do light afflictions do? I said, hmm, they work for me. Oh, they're my employees. <laughs> and I thought, they work for me. And then I read over in James chapter uh, 1 in the Phillips translation way back in the 50s, where it says, my brethren, with all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your life, don't resent them as their truth. Welcome them as friends. So you got more friends than you thought you had. <laughs> realize, they, realize they come to test your faith and basically goes ahead to say, develop the nature and the character of Christ within you. So I tell people, I don't have any in the world. I just have friends and employees. And I said, these friends, trials, tests, troubles, problems, are working for me and then these people that give me a bad time they're working for me and and they're my friends so i tell people somebody comes up to us and say, oh you're old prophet i don't believe you i don't believe in prophets yeah 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 i get my bill for out and i hand them some money they say what's this for i said well i pay my employees well i'm not your employee I said, sure you are. You've been producing for me like crazy. I mean, you've been. This, I should give you a hundred dollars instead of twenty because I said you've been, you've been, you've been this producing the fruit of the spirit. I'm, I'm be, I've been, you've been putting teaching long suffering within me, patience, mercy, forgiveness, and 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 that all of this grace within me. And if it wasn't for the fact I know that God's using you to develop his character within me, it'd be pow, right in the antenna. Because I wouldn't put up with your foolishness. But since you're my employee working for me, I'll pay you. I'll pay you. I know I that when I got to that part in the book, I was like, oh, that, that it's like a game changer. Like, as I was reading your book, like, you know, you said, oh, you know, maybe in my lifetime I've experienced some trials and tribulations. And I've... I know not to ask the why question, but what for, like, what do I need to learn in this? But I found myself in this season, especially the not last nine months or so. I like you talk in chapter seven about, and like my book has got all of these little things so that I could quickly reference it. I'm like, we could go so many directions, but the one that you really talked about was the steel rail and going through the test of the steel rail. And I was, I was reading what you went through in that. I'm like, that has been my life the last nine months. I remember posting um, when we had lost a friend that was really close to us the same week our son was getting married. Like, I don't think that these two things of um, there's a season and time for everything are supposed to clash so violently. And then when I read your story and your testimony, I'm like, okay, I see, I see what's going on. And that, and, and the no more whys. Like when we understand that these trials, tribulations and things are coming at us, that they're actually working in us to accomplish what Christ said um, through the apostle Paul in Romans eight, which is by far my favorite passage of scripture. So when I got your book, I was like, oh, yes. They release it. In fact, chapter 10, I talk about the two reasons God created Adam and Eve, male and female. One was to reproduce like kind and fill the earth with a race in God's image and likeness. And God's original purpose was for the earth to be filled with the God race, like God, uh, like Jesus now we say. And I say, but there's another reason he said, you two shall become one. And I think when he said that, he chuckled and said, uh-huh, you're going to become one. <laughs> but I say, marriage is the ideal place for God to put us in that process of conformity to, de to, to deliver us from selfishness and self-centeredness and die to self. And so when, I, and when I'm preaching this, sometimes I'll take a couple on the front row and I'm, I'll take out a $20 bill. And I'll, throw, I'll tell the woman, I said, next time he starts afflicting you, yeah, 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 yeah. Just take his money and give it to him. And they look at one another. She gives it to him. Some of them will really give it to him. And then, then after a moment, he'll start giving it back to me. And I say, no, no, you keep it, because next week you'll be giving it to her. <laughs> and I tell people, oh, my wife and I had 59 years of the most wonderful, compatible life. We got married at 21 and 18. She married her pastor. And we, we had a wonderful relationship. But we as much enough different that we were each other's friend and employee at times. And and then when I tell couples, I say, God puts opposites together uh, to perfect each other and gives you enough love not to kill each other in the process. Oh, that is so 
And yes, that is exactly one of the things that you do talk about in the book. I really appreciated that because I thought my husband were probably the opposite extremes of each other, but yet how God brought us together to be one complete whole and the way that we, as we pastor our church and just our different giftings and our different styles, we complement each other, but yeah. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'm going to carry around a $20 bill and then tell, and give him your book and tell him to read that chapter. So. <laughs> you know, I said, you pray large upon my name. He was just what you needed to kill your flesh and come forth your spirit and love you enough to perfection. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, I think as I was reading the book, like I have so many uh, pages highlighted and marked. There's so much in this book. So I just really want to tell my listeners and my viewers, um, on our station to just, it's your highest calling, discover the secret process to fulfill your destiny. And this is, you're gonna, you're gonna devour this, you're gonna understand it, you're not gonna ask the why questions anymore. Chapter seven really was my favorite, I think because that's where I found myself right now in this season of realizing that there's the ups and downs. And I thought, wow, he, Bishop Bill, you only had to go through three weeks. I just a few of them. Yeah, just a few of them. And then I was reading it and you're like, I went through this this trial and tribulation, the ups and the downs and, and the steel rail process. And then you said it was like two years later that the Lord gave you the company of prophets. It was like you were going through these tests and trials to um, work things out. And then two years later, God gave us. So I'm like, okay, Lord, okay, I can push through this. I, I can have my ups and my downs because I can see now what you're doing. So it encouraged me so much. Can you talk a little bit more about that chapter seven and describe some major examples of the conforming process in us? Well, let me, I, I think it's chapter seven has a, did you understand the fa hands, the fingers and the thumb? Yes, the hands and fingers and the thumb. It doesn't make sense a lot of Christians because you go through some nonsensical things. I'm sure you've gone through, I've gone, I've gone through things that didn't make any sense like that roller coaster ride we had in, in life for three weeks of high and low and hot and cold and hot and cold and death and life and marriage and funerals and all that it, it didn't make any sense and a lot of things we go through makes no natural sense not the reason to tell people you've got to keep the eternal view if you don't have the eternal view of what the God's purpose is, and what he's after. And the reason, and I have the attitude Paul said in Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory of Christ's likeness that shall be revealed in us. Because he says the whole creation's waiting for that glory to be manifest through us. So, but the, what I don't understand, how can I go through something that's contrary to God's word? In other words, how can I go through something when it's God's will? I'll be healed, I'll be in health, I'll be prosperous, the family go great. I mean, in other words, if you read the book of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, where it says an open heaven, then it says it's God's will you be blessed in the house, blessed in the city, you're blessed, your family's blessed, your children's blessed, uh, your enemies come out against you one way, they play seven ways, and it says that your everything you touch will prosper. So it's God's will that if you take the, the four fingers, this is all your natural life, physical, financial, social, spiritual, marriage, family, children, everything. Now, According to God's general will, it's God's will for everything to go wonderful, go wonderful, go wonderful. But there is a higher will called the will of God for conformity, the law of transformation and process of conformity. And the way the Lord explained it to me and the way I explained it in the book is, how does it make sense? Well, when I go to uh, Korea, I go every year and preach, we have a Bible college or in churches. I get on a plane, now there's a law of gravity I'm sure you have it in Washington as we do here in Florida, <laughs> that anything heavier than air is going to come down. Now I get on that great big 730, uh, 767 plane, it got 300 people on it, weighs tons, it goes down about 45 minutes, seconds, it takes off, goes in the air, stays in the air, and comes down 15 hours later in Korea. Now, there is a law of what we call aerodynamics, lift and thrust. Now, the law of aerodynamics, when it goes up and stays up and comes down and controlled, doesn't destroy the law of gravity. The law of gravity is still in the process. It hasn't changed one bit. It's still as true as ever. And just when we go through a Job experience and God has to take these through living hell for a little while, 
It doesn't change God's will that we're to be healthy, families to be great, finances to be great, everything to go great. That's still God's will. But there is a job time that God takes us through a process to develop the higher nature and character of God in us. We do not pull up on the fruit of the Spirit automatically. We have to be forced into it. It's a process. And, and so we go through that process, and though it is God's will, yet there is a higher will called the will of conformity to the likeness of Christ. And he will subject these four to anything he has to to perfect the one. And like my, yeah, you read in there where after we went through that three week of uh, just horrible situations, blood saturation, horrible, and, the, and the, then after my wife said, I can't take one thing more after all that we went through. And she said, I feel like I've been skinned alive and every nerve's on edge, and I can't take one thing more. And then I got on that dune buggy, broke my arm, come back and called her. My son-in-law called her and said, we got to take Bill to the hospital, broke his arm. She said, don't tease me. I told you I couldn't take one thing more. So we get to the hospital, and I'm back there for an hour and a half, and my daughter went to get us some food, and son-in-law went to check on what was going on. She's sitting there by herself. And the Lord came to her and said, Evelyn, um, you remember what you said on the way from Pensacola to Phoenix Springs? I said, she said, Lord, I said a lot of things. Which one are you thinking about? He said, when you told me, you said you couldn't take one thing more. Yeah, he said, it. and she talked to God like she did me, very straight. She said, that's right, I can't take one thing more. I told you I couldn't take one thing more. He said, is your husband's broken arm one thing more? She said, yeah. He said, well, what are you going to do about it? She thought a moment, she thought, now she got saved, she was three, filled with the Holy Ghost, she was seven, raised in a Pentecostal church where everything was a sin but breathing. That had to be done in church. So she wasn't ever worldly. She wasn't ambitious to be adventurous. So she's been a little obedient, sweet girl all of her life. And so she's never known the world. And she said, well, I could go get drunk, but I wouldn't know what to buy to get drunk. <laughs> she said, well, I could have a nervous breakdown, but that sounds crazy. And finally she said, Lord, I guess I like Peter, where can I go but to you? And I just serve you, Lord, and, and you're going to be my God. And the Lord, and he, he expected the Lord to say, Bless your little old heart. Evelyn, I, I know it's rough and you're going through it, but I just got to take you through this process uh, to develop some things in you. And she expects a sort of mercy and understanding. But he said, He said, Evelyn, I love you, but don't you ever threaten me that way again. And shocked her, she said, well, What do you mean? He said, I promise you in your word that I, as you're my child, I never, never allow you to go into any situation that I didn't give you grace and wisdom and ability to go there. I never let you be put in a position that I didn't supply what you needed to make it through and I'd take you through. And don't you ever threaten me that way again. Do you know what took all fear out of her over the future? After that, she never had a fear of the future, fear of her finances failing. I mean, it did something in her and it took what some of the wild streak out of me from driving wild and doing wild. But, but the, God's highest desire above everything else is us to be conformed to his image and likeness. And he wants, and I, and, and you know, in the back page, I talk about what's going to be like when I'm like Christ. I give all these characteristics. And I said, Lord, after 66 years of ministry, 70 years of being a Christian, you know, I've overcome most of my worldly habits and problems and my fleshly things. What, what is it that I need yet to be conformed to your image and likeness? And it took me to the chapter by and where we raised Lazarus from the dead. And he, and he said, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. And whatever I say will come to pass. And I, I thought, wow. He said, you don't have that kind of faith, Bill Hammond. You don't trust my, me like I trust my Heavenly Father. You don't have that confidence that you're in me and I'm in you. And that I've anointed you and appointed you, and you're to speak my word. And whatever you pray, and by will and way, it's going to be done. And then I'll give you the power to whatever you say will come to pass. I said, okay, Lord, I agree there. All right. So let's start working on it. So I said, start the process. Start the process to bring me. I only got maybe 10 or 15 more years left to really go for it. I'm going to preach till I'm 95. I'm only 85 now. So I've been going 200,000 miles a year. I'll keep on going. But I'd like to get to the place where I have that same faith and confidence in you that you had in the Father. And you can have the same faith and confidence in me that Father God has in you. And I thought, wow, that, that would be worth it all. And so when you realize the value 
of going through it. And that it all it is working for your good. It's for you, and you, it's hard to resent something that's for your good. Sure. You know, these, these these friends and employees are for your good. And I, you know, there's one, David. There's one scripture after 60 years, I still couldn't understand. I'm sure you got a few scriptures you wonder what is it really mean. <laughs> in Second Corinthians 12:10, Paul says, "I take pleasure in." Now I've asked numerous people at meetings. I said, "Finish that." statement for him. He said, I take pleasure in. And they will say, well, my family, cooking, shopping, spending my husband's money, going here and doing that. I said, I've never found any but myself or anybody else list what Paul listed. And never did make sense to me. He said, I take pleasure in, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, infirmities, tribulation, or reproach, necessities, troubles, problems, I mean, you, you read it in different translations, you got a whole list of things. I thought, how do you take pleasure until finally I got the revelation? Oh, those are his friends and employees helping him fulfill his greatest passion. And Paul's greatest passion was all that I might know him and be conformed to his image and likeness. So his greatest passion was to be like Christ. So he sees all these things beaten with 39 stripes five times. Beating five times with boards, shipwrecked, floating in sea day and night, rejected by the brother, stoned. Not like some people get stoned, but I mean, rocks hit him and killed him or him with death. I mean, that list is that long that he went through. And yet he, he's the one that wrote all things work together to conform me to the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. So the devil can't hurt me. He can only make me more like Christ to fulfill my greatest passion and destiny. And if a Christian gets that attitude, it takes the blues out. It takes the depression out. It takes the failure and failure and condemnation and frustration. It's like that experience I told you about in the book where my loss was gain. You know, when I, we, we bought that property and paid, so a brother gave me $50,000. We put a down payment on it, and I set it up on three payments for $40,000 each. And because my wife said, God told her, he's going to give us that property. And, uh, and I had a prophecy that said, God's going to give it to you. Now, later when I lost the property, I went back and read it again. I saw words that I never saw before. I said, I'm going to give it to you. And when I take it back, I miss that every time I read it. And when I take it back. And so, you know, so I preached all that year, mentioned the book. I mentioned the property. But I've only got five thousand dollars in the whole year, yeah. and so um, this was the first time we'd owned property and for the ministry there in Phoenix, Arizona. We bought that property there, and uh, I, I couldn't get down the money for the payment. It was due uh, in March '79, so they gave me 90 day leave, and I didn't have the money. They gave me 30 more days. I still I tried every way. Uh, I, I found the scripture to be true. God opens a door no man can shut, and God shuts a door no man can open. And he would not open that door. Anyway, I bumped my head against every way, did everything. I did everything imaginable, made every deal. Nothing would work. And finally, I had to sign that property all back to him. It, I'm telling you, it just devastated me. It was, because it was, a, it was, you know, it was reflection on my manhood, my ministry, my faith. I didn't blame God. I blamed me for not being able to believe God in my failure. And I did all the devil's work. I condemned myself. I disqualified myself. I blasted myself. I belittled myself. And But we had our school of the Holy Spirit going. And I'd go every Friday night, preach and prophesy over people. they get blessed, rejoice, tears in their eyes. Yeah, he only got blessed. And I'd go back home and call my Elijah pit and try to reach up and find the bottom. They were discouraged and frustrated. And for six months, God would speak through me and minister through me, but not speak to me about the situation. So I would just, and finally one night I went walking. Uh, we, we was driving back from Tucson to Phoenix. We stopped in San Marcos. And I told my wife, I'm going to go walking. I went walking and the Lord spoke finally. He said, Bill Hammond, I said, yeah, Lord, you're really upset about the loss of that property, aren't you? I said, oh, yes, I lost it all. I meant it's gone. It's gone. I tried, you know, I was still a it's gone. He said, you know, you didn't lose anything. I said, God, I lost it. It's gone. I had to sign it all back. All the money we put into it, the 50000 the brother gave me, it's all gone. I lost it all. He says, you didn't lose anything. I thought, God, have you been on vacation for six months? I'm telling you, I lost it all. And he said, you didn't lose anything. I said, okay, you're talking something I don't understand. What are you saying? 
He said, you didn't lose anything. He said, that was my tuition. I was willing to pay for your wisdom and maturity. He said, I can give you houses, land, people overnight, but I cannot give you wisdom and maturity. I don't know how the big eye dropped here. Shoop, wisdom, shoop, maturity. It's a process. And I had to take you through this process to see if you were willing and you would stay true, even though you failed, even though it looked like you made a mistake, looks like you lost everything, but you stayed true to me. And he says, and then I'm gonna release a revelation to you that's going to be millions of people are going to be affected by it. It's going to affect the church. And that was in 79. And three years later, it gave me the revelation of the great company of prophets that I wrote the book on, on prophets and personal prophecy and talked about the great company of prophets, which was raising up. And God started the process of the restoration of prophets and apostles back into the church. And in 1988, we had the restoration of the prophets as I wrote the book on the prophets and the prophetic movement. And that one and gives a four edition of prophets. Yeah. Then we started training. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I started it's tattered and torn because I read it so much. And I started training prophets. And so I found that prophets uh, kind of like a bowl of cereal. Sometimes there's nuts and flakes in there. <laughs> you got to work with them. So I had to develop principles to practice and pitfalls to avoid in the prophetic. So we started training people, and I wrote the book on the manual for ministry and spiritual gifts, and then we started training people. Then the prophets was restored, then the apostles came along, so I wrote the book of apostle prophets, coming moves of God. Then I finally, then I knew after all five were restored, we could have a saints movement, so I wrote the book on the day of the saints, and the saints movement happened in 2007. Sidney Jacobs, Chuck Pierce, and Dutch Sheets, and New Ingalls were all there, and they witnessed that the saints movement had been there. Then when that happened, I was able to catch up on the work of the Holy Spirit. I wrote the book, Who Am I? Why Am I Here? Eight Reasons Why God Created the Human Race. And number seven is worship, and number eight is fellowship, but there's six before, behind that that's more important and relevant to God. And then God showed me that the third reformation had began in 2008, so I wrote the book on prophetic scripture yet to be fulfilled, supposed to be the third and final church reformation, but the destiny image said nobody know what it is, I said, that's why I'm writing a book, so they'll know what it is. So I got to get the title changed on that. <laughs> then the Lord said, write the book that will help them fulfill it. I wrote the book on 70 reasons why God gave us the gift of the spirit language. 70 reasons. We've got a million dollar gift, and only writing five or ten dollar checks on it. So 70 reasons for speaking in tongues. Yep. And then I, got, I saw that these false doctrines were sweeping in, and things were going on. So I wrote the book, How Can These Things Be? Dealing with what is sin and grace and all the false doctrines, how to handle them, how to relate to them, and did that one, and the subtitle was a preacher and a miracle worker, but denied heaven. Yep. And then uh, I wrote the one on birth into your prophetic purpose, and then I wrote the one on uh, God's weapons of war. I don't, yeah, I have some here. This one, God's weapons of war. I originally was God's World War Three, but chose the one to call it, and, then, and I've, I've, I've led over 30 nations in corporate warfare. I do that more than anything else. And then I started having uh, mentoring days where I mentored people, and I so I wrote the book on it, on your highest calling, because you can have all this success, but if you don't have Christ's likeness, it's worthless. Because 1 Corinthians 13, he says, you can be a prophet and prophesy, you can be a faith and be blue mountains, you can be uh, charismatic and love everybody, you can even be humanitarian and give your body to be burned, And but if you don't have love, and God is love, and love is Christ, so you can say, well, if you don't have Christ's likeness, you're nothing. And so, this, that's the reason I say, this is the most important book for individuals, how not only to live victorious, but get your priorities in line. What's the most important? What's relevant? What's not relevant? What you're worried and fussing about now is not worth it because it's all work for your good. And if you're a Christian, if you love God and call it according to his purpose, all things have to work to make you more like Christ. But most people think it means to make my life easier, make people like me better. No, 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 it's opposite. It's to make you through whatever's necessary to conform to the likeness of Christ. God loves us too much. He won't let us be less than our best. And whatever it takes, he'll take us through. Hallelujah. Oh gosh, absolutely. Like I had, like you answered, can I just say you answered all the questions that I was going to ask you. I feel like, I feel so honored to just have you teach to me and my audience, just like you just unloaded like on a, like a fire hose, but I just, I absolutely love it. Bishop Hammond. I have, 
I just, I want, I want one more question to ask you in just a second, but can I read um, at, in the back of the book in chapter 11, you describe exactly what it is to look like Christ and to have Christ likeness. And the one that I pulled this out that I wanted to read to my listeners, and I just really want to encourage them. You know, this is this, you say, this is your most important book that you've written for the individual. And some are saying that it's really your legacy that you're going to leave to the body of Christ. And it's powerful. Like, I is so powerful. It's so timely for me and where we're at as a, as a family, as a church, my husband and I personally. And so I'm passing it off to him because I've been devouring it. So he's getting to read it next. And then we're going to talk about it. But you said um, in the last chapter, and it's under the Christ likeness um, in faith. And you said this, we, if we are to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, we must come to a place where we have a relationship with Jesus just as he had with his father. We must believe in our hearts that we can do anything he tells us to do, be anything he wants us to be, fulfill everything he commissioned us to fulfill. And all of the other points that you put in there about Christ-likeness, it all comes down to, will we believe, will we obey, will we step out, and will we say, yes, I'm willing to relinquish all that I am so that I can be all that you are. Amen. So you'd recommend it for Christmas for your friend that's going through a lot of things, huh? Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Like people are, I, I'm going to, I'm buying it for people. I have, so I have one last question, just because you, you have been called and I really believe that you are the father of the prophetic movement. I listened to your teachings when I first got into the prophetic movement um, over 25 years ago. I came from a very conservative church. I didn't know anything about prophecy, prophets. I didn't even, the church I was in didn't even believe in that. And then, but I had this gifting and I was so frustrated. And then I came across to you and I listened to your teachings. You know, it was back on cassette tape back in the day that people were handing me. Um, and I was listening to that and I was reading your books. And so would you um, just share with people a little bit about the, um, what you think God is doing right now worldwide in the prophetic? Well, let me tell you that we're in the second phase of the prophetic movement. It started in, uh, uh, as an example, in Ezekiel, we prophesied the Valley of Dry Bones. Well, the, the 1988 was the birthday of the prophetic movement. And there was a uh, there was a noise in the world that the prophets are here, prophets are being restored, and it caused a great shaking in the churches. They didn't believe there were prophets. And then they started coming together, uh, networks and fellowships of people. We had Christian International, and then you had uh, the other prophets and the other groups, and it's formed networks over the last 30 years, and it's taken it and taught and trained and equipped people. But in 2014, God started the second phase of the prophetic when he told Ezekiel, he said, prophesy again, and then he prophesied again, and it said they stood up and came alive, that great army, and and the resurrection of life came within them and became an exceeding great army. We're right now moving in resurrection of life anointing to be able to demonstrate the kingdom of God like it's never been demonstrated before. And we're moving into the sixth doctrine of Christ, eternal judgment, the first stages. The first stage of resurrection of the dead is first resurrection of life to demonstrate the kingdom. The uh, second phase is the first resurrection, the rapture. Third phase is the great eternal judgment. I mean, uh, when God all when they all are raised, the dead are raised. And then the judgment in Psalm uh, 149 said, to execute the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. And that's what I on this book, God's Weapons of War, we're in the th move of God called the Army of the Lord moving. And God's raising up warriors, not old folks' homes, not blessing society. People cycle to some churches and they say, well, I just want God to love on me. I want God to love on me. I go to other churches and we just want to party. And I said, well, listen, if God had created man just to have somebody to love on, he'd have created Adam and Eve babies. And that's all they're good for is loving on, you know, until they get a little older. I said, if God wanted to just have a party, he'd have created Adam and Eve teenagers. 
but he didn't. He created them grown men and women that he could talk to, relate to, fellowship with, share his plans, share his vision, share his purpose with. And the God's raising up men and women. We were born again babes in order to grow to maturity. And so therefore, God's looking for grown up men and women who he can trust, he can relate to, who love him, trust him, and he can trust them, and we're one with him. And that's my passion and desire, the only that I might come to that place that he can trust me uh, and I can trust him like he trusted his heavenly father. And that's what we're coming to now. And so every, there's, I'm sure people that watch you are hungry for God. They're hungry for the things of God. And I just want to release that prophetic anointing right now that God releases that stirring of the spirit of wisdom and revelation that Paul prayed for the Ephesians that will come upon the saints right now and they'll get the revelation that God's for them. Nothing can be against them. All things are working together to form them into Christ's likeness. Therefore, they can lay down every burden. They can forget everything they've gone through they don't understand and don't lean to your own understanding but understand this you're in god's hand you're in god's plan and he's working it all for his glory and for your good and just think like paul said the sufferings all that you may have to suffer is not worthy to be compared with the christ likeness and what it gives us for eternity for eternities forever this is just a few more years i mean rise shine your light is come forget the past do like paul said press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling for it's all all work together to bring you to this stage and fulfill your greatest desire to be like Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Woo! That was so good, Bishop Hammond. Thank you so much for that. Well, you're on fire. I should probably just let you keep going. Um, <laughs> um, can you tell us, can you tell us how we can get a hold of your books? How can we connect with you and your ministry? Because you do have a wealth of just revelation in every one of those books you've talked about and also your newest one too. And so how can we get a hold of this? How can people connect with you and your ministry? Uh, these are in every bookstore and all my other books are in Spanish too, by the way. Uh, they're, and they're all in bookstores, wherever books are and and you can get them at www.christianinternational.org. If you want to order, get a special deal on them. Uh, I'll give you a special one. And then, uh, but bookstores have them everywhere right now. That book, that that charismatic books are so. And so this book will be transforming. I mean, of all the books I've written, I tell people if I, I tell people if I only had one more message to preach to you, and I'd never see you again this side of eternity. I get this truth to you because you're going to need it to make it to the end. There's things coming up on the earth that's glorious, but it's also some horrible things coming. And we got to know how to walk in faith, walk in victory, and not worry about what we're going through, knowing that God is controlled 24 7. 24 7. His angels are about us. He's watching over us. Nothing can happen to us but what's going to work for our good. So just our friends and employees. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord and praise Amen. God. Amen. That is so good. That is so good. Actually, and I would just say that this book too is it's a game changer. I have had it for a couple of weeks and I've been devouring it and going back and reading it as I've been preparing for this interview with you. And your highest calling was a game changer for me. I know it's gonna be a game changer for so many people too. I just wanna thank you. Thank you for the honor of having you on, Bishop Hammond. I am just overjoyed to be able to sit here with you. And I know my listeners and my viewers are going to be so blessed um, abundantly and beyond anything that they could ever imagine when they listen to this podcast. So thank you so much for that. Bless you, Debbie. Bless all that listen to you. Amen. Amen. you great work. Keep up the good work. God bless you. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we encourage you to tear to hear the voice of God. Thank you for listening today. I'm Debbie Kitterman. If you were encouraged in any way, we would be honored if you would subscribe to our podcast or our YouTube channel and share it with your friends. We want to get the message out there about Bishop Hammond and his new book, Your Highest Calling. You're, wanna, you're going to want to get this. You're going to want to actually get five of them and pass four of them on to somebody else. It's that powerful. It's that good. It's that life-changing. So again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to having you join us on next week's show.
Shadows of 